So yeah, my name is Grace Johnson and I'm the project officer for the Hedgehog Street Project. Uh, so that's a joint campaign between the People's Trust for Endangered Species and the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. Um, what I'm going to do is actually just stop sharing my video just because my internet's been really patchy today. So um, yeah, and then you can see the slides a little bit better as well there. Um, yeah, so Lauren and I are really happy to be here today to talk to you virtually um, about hedgehogs and roads. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, um, we're going to go through the hedgehog declines and threats in the UK. Uh, we're going to talk about the ways in which roads can be dangerous for hedgehogs. We're going to go through a little bit of previous research, look at some potential solutions, and then Lauren's going to talk about her ongoing research on the topic. Uh, so a little bit about the declines of UK hedgehogs. Um, so these are quite commonly used figures when we're talking about the hedgehog decline. Um, so these are probably figures that you've heard before. Uh, this information comes from the State of Britain's Hedgehogs Report, which was last published in 2018. And that's by these charities that set up Hedgehog Street, so the People's Trust and the Hedgehog Society. Uh, the report tells us that we've lost 50% of rural hedgehogs and a third of hedgehogs in urban areas. So 50% in rural, 30% in urban. Um, so we're currently working on the next State of Britain's Hedgehogs report, and we're hoping to publish that later this year, and probably in the autumn. So that'll be one to keep an eye out for. Uh, it's very difficult, as with any species, to put an exact number on the population. Um, and an estimate in 1995 put the hedgehog population at about 1.5 million. Uh, it's now thought to be less than a million, um, but we, we, of course, we can't say that for sure. Uh, so back in 2011, these charities actually joined forces and launched the Hedgehog Street Project. Uh, so we're celebrating our 10th birthday this year. So we've got lots of exciting plans coming up. Uh, just a little bit of background about Hedgehog Street. Uh, so it's quite a far reaching project. Uh, there's a lot of different elements. I've got a few examples here in the pictures below. Uh, so first of all there, the bottom left picture, we attend a lot of events to engage with the public, but also key stakeholders. Uh, so people like developers, farmers, ecologists, um, obviously that's more in normal times. We haven't <laughs> attended any events recently, but hopefully we'll be able to soon. Um, the next picture along there is myself and a colleague helping out with a camera trapping research project. Uh, so we support a number of research projects to try and untangle the reasons for the hedgehog decline and look at potential solutions. The next picture along there is a training course that we run and that's on hedgehog ecology and land management. And that's to try and tackle habitat issues. Um, so we do get a really good variety of people attending. Um, so we get ecologists, green space managers, uh, conservation volunteers, wildlife hospitals. Um, it's a really, really good mix of people. Uh, the next picture along there is our MP species champion. So we work with him. Um, most recently, we've been working to try to increase the legal protection in the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, and that's going to be through an amendment to the Environment Bill. So we're just waiting for that to come back into the Commons to get a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more information about that. Uh, and finally, media interviews and articles. So we do a lot of that to raise uh, the profile and awareness of hedgehogs and the conservation work that we do. Um, and some of you might have actually spotted us on BBC Breakfast this morning, which was very exciting. So uh, yeah, that was, that was really good. Uh, so there are numerous threats to hedgehogs in the UK. Unfortunately, it's different things in different areas, uh, rural versus urban. Um, so one threat that they face is agricultural intensification. Uh, this is a process that's been going on for several decades, and what we seem to have nowadays is large crop fields, there's often pesticides used, uh, trying to get the maximum output of the land, um, and sadly this does limit the insect food, but also the shelter opportunities for hedgehogs, uh, so it's estimated that we've lost 50% of hedgerows since the Second World War, and hedgerows are really important habitat for hedgehogs and also um, many other wildlife species as well. The, the giveaways in the name there for uh, hedgehogs and hedgerows. <laughs> uh, next along there, we've got habitat loss. Uh, so again, that's linking to the massive loss of hedgerows, um, but there's you know, also more and more development. There's less suitably wild and diverse areas for hedgehogs. Uh, next along there, we've got habitat fragmentation. That's a really big problem. Uh, so even when there are suitable areas of habitat for them, you know, if there's places like wildlife friendly gardens, parks, where there are hedgerows, 
they're often broken up by roads, buildings, walls, meaning that they can't move easily through the landscape. Uh, another one is badger predation. Uh, so badgers are the main natural predator of hedgehogs in the UK. Uh, and hedgehogs do often avoid areas where there's badgers residing. But it's really important to note that this is a completely natural predator prey interaction. Um, it's been going on for thousands of years. We know that the two species can thrive alongside each other where the conditions are good and there's enough insect prey for them both. Um, and also hedgehogs are declining in areas characterized by low badger numbers. So that tells us that it's not a major factor in the decline of hedgehogs. Another issue is garden hazards. So we've got a few pictures on the bottom there, a few examples. Uh, so things like chemical use, entanglement in sort of litter and netting, uh, bonfires, you know, we do campaigns every November, you know, check your bonfires, um, injuries from garden equipment like strimmers and lawnmowers. Um, so all of these things can unfortunately be really dangerous for hedgehogs. And then moving on to the topic that we're all interested in today, which is roadkill. Uh, so the information that I'll go through today is actually from a literature review that Lauren's done as part of her PhD project. Uh, and that's looking at the impacts and potential mitigation of road mortality for hedgehogs in Europe. So we'll be drawing on some research from the UK, but also across Europe as well. So how concerned should we be about hedgehog mortality on roads? It's really important to highlight that there's actually two main effects of roads on hedgehogs. So firstly, we've got the direct depletion of individuals. So that's what we see when we're out and about, that's the roadkill. Uh, sadly, it's quite a common sight on our roads, um, especially in certain areas. Uh, but another effect is that local populations are starting to become isolated. Uh, so roads create barriers in the landscape that hedgehogs aren't able to sort of safely cross, meaning that they can't travel easily and mix together. Uh, so this can result in reduced gene flow, which uh, can lead to reduced genetic diversity in a local population. Um, and that can actually mean that they're less resilient to disease and other stresses. Uh, so it's estimated that between 113,000 and 340,000 are killed on our roads each year. Um, but that doesn't mean a whole lot without a more robust population estimate. Uh, so if that's, for example, if that's out of 1 million hedgehogs, then it is a really huge proportion and obviously very worrying. Um, but that does highlight the importance of looking at the proportion of the population that's killed on roads. Um, so this has been looked at in some European research. So it's thought to be between 3 and 22% of populations in Sweden. And a Polish study found that it was 24%. Um, so both of the higher estimates here are around the quarter mark. So quite a worrying um, portion of the population. Uh, so we're going to do a poll now. <laughs> So I think Kieran's going to I'll hand over to Kieran to do this poll. So basically what we want to know is, yeah, have you seen hedgehog roadkill in the last year? You can see a lot of yeses coming in. <laughs> Just to let everybody know, this is anonymous, so we, we can't see what individuals have put. I'll give you another couple of seconds. We've got a good return rate, actually. A lot of people have already answered, but yeah, if as many of you as possible can get your answers in. Right, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna close that now and share the results for Grace to talk about. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, again, not surprising. 70% of people have seen it, unfortunately seen a road killed hedgehog in the last year. Um, it's, yeah, unfortunately it's a really common sight on our, on our roads. Okay. Uh, so this is a map of roadkill records from last year. Um, and these are records that have been submitted to the Big Hedgehog Map. Uh, so the Big Hedgehog Map is run as part of Hedgehog Street. And we ask people to log sightings of hedgehogs, um, whether you've seen them alive, whether you know, you're lucky enough to see them walking around the garden or a local park. Um, or whether they're sadly dead or roadkill. And all of that information contributes to our understanding of how hedgehogs are distributed across the UK. And we share those records with the NBN Atlas and also with various local biological record centers. So as you can see, it's, quite, it's, it's definitely quite a widespread problem, you know, hedgehogs being killed on roads. Uh, so are some individuals more at risk? This is quite an interesting question. Uh, reproductively active male hedgehogs are the most likely to be victims of roadkill. 
and this is because of their large home ranges. Uh, so they roam further and tend to cross more roads as a result. And the reason that they need to roam is in search of females in the summer months. Um, so they do mate with more than one female. And unfortunately, traveling further means that they're crossing more roads and they're put at more risk. Uh, but interestingly, in the autumn, this flips and it's the females that are more in danger. So they need to travel further later in the year. And this is as they're searching for enough food after spending all of their energy rearing their hoglets or baby hedgehogs in the summer. Um, and at this point, they need to build their fat reserves quickly before the hibernation season. Uh, another question, are some roads more dangerous for hedgehogs? Uh, Turkish and Bulgarian studies have found that smaller roads appear to be more dangerous for hedgehogs than larger roads and motorways. Um, so it may be that hedgehogs are attempting more crossings on quieter roads, you know, with fewer barriers that initially appear safer. Or it could be that these roads are in areas with more hedgehogs. Uh, that hasn't been determined yet, but it could certainly be a combination of both factors. It's also been found that roads with more traffic and higher speeds, so motorways would be an example of that, uh, they commonly have physical barriers and are therefore avoided by hedgehogs, although yeah, they just can't cross them. Uh, a study of hedgehog movement in Southampton showed that um, it showed what we call road avoidance behavior, and that increased with wider roads, which typically have more traffic. Uh, population fragmentation. So we mentioned that a little bit earlier. There's actually an ongoing research project in London just looking at the effects of this isolation on populations. Uh, so understanding how big of a problem this isolation and reduced genetic diversity might be. Uh, so genetic diversity is important for populations for surviving illness, adapting to the environment. Um, and if there's a lack of that diversity, it can put local populations at risk. Uh, I thought it was good to highlight some research that was published last year. So that was by the University of Sussex and it was funded by the People's Trust, Hedgehog Society and the Mammal Society. Um, and that was looking at the when, where and why of road casualties in Britain. Uh, so I'll give you a whistle stop tour of the results. Of course, the full paper's online and that's gonna have a lot more detail and explanation. In terms of when, uh, road casualties were low in winter and rose steadily throughout the year, reaching a peak in July. Uh, this ties in with what we know about hedgehog ecology and life cycle. So we know that they hibernate in the winter and they're much more active during the summer. Uh, in terms of where there was high numbers of road kills, so areas associated with a high probability were urban and grassland, with the highest danger being on the suburban edges of large cities and throughout small towns and villages. In terms of why, uh, the casualties peaking in July suggest that road kill is likely to be linked to breeding. Uh, so in July, that's when vulnerable juvenile hedgehogs are starting to leave their mothers um, and they begin to forage for themselves and they often disperse to new areas at this stage in order to do that. And that unfortunately, again, means crossing more roads. Uh, so it's all a little bit of doom and gloom, but if we look at some solutions, <laughs> uh, there are a few potential solutions for road mortality. Um, all have you know, benefits and drawbacks, so I'll just go through a few of those. Uh, so first of all, we've got fencing and crossing structures. So fencing is a commonly used approach to prevent wildlife mortality on roads, um, but fencing alone does actually worsen the issue of populations becoming isolated um, because, of course, it's creating barriers within the landscape that hedgehogs aren't able to cross. Uh, so a better option is uh, thought to be combining fencing with road crossing structures. So things like green bridges. We've got a green bridge um, on that right hand side picture there. Um, and also road tunnels for wildlife as well. Uh, so this approach, this approach is beneficial because it's going to reduce road mortality um, and it's also going to conserve or potentially even increase the permeability of the landscape. Uh, studies from all over Europe have recorded hedgehogs using these crossing structures. It's also been found that badgers do use them, but whether this affects the use by hedgehogs, we, we don't know at this point, so that's potential for further research. The next potential solution we've got here is traffic calming measures. Uh, so by this, we mean things like speed bumps, speed restrictions, warning signs. So really just aiming to reduce driving speed in particular areas. Uh, the good thing about these options is that they're significantly cheaper than road crossing structures. And of course, this is something that has to be taken into account. Uh, they may also be just as effective as road crossing structures. 
Um, and the aim of these measures is to enhance the preferred crossing sites. So those that are commonly used but aren't necessarily roadkill hotspots. The drawback of these measures though, is that they don't always necessarily serve the intended purpose of reducing speed. So sadly, a lot of people of course do just break speed limits, avoid, you know, ignore signs, things like that. So that's one of the drawbacks of that approach. Another potential option is to manage the surrounding habitat. So improving habitat may mean that hedgehogs can actually thrive without having to cross so many roads in search of food and shelter in the first place. Uh, so you're going to improve habitat quality, you know, generally, but certainly around road verges and um, reducing the shrubbery in the middle of roads as well. And also bearing in mind that hedgehogs and of course other wildlife often follow linear features like hedgerows just ensuring that these are running parallel, so next to the road rather than perpendicular, where the hedgerow would essentially just be leading them towards danger. Uh, another approach looks at the bigger picture and actually suggests that we should be considering wildlife more when planning road layout and location. So there's, there's a few things to bear in mind. We need to consider how landscape configuration can be designed to meet the needs of human settlements, so our towns and cities, the associated road system, so how we're all connected together, and also habitat networks, so simultaneously all at the same time. So it is quite a lot of things to think about. Uh, there's been computer simulation studies that have reported that hedgehogs benefited when traffic was spread evenly over a lot of roads, which thinned out the traffic rather than when they were concentrated on fewer roads. Uh, so we've got a few options for mitigation there, a few potential solutions, but it's really important to um, consider these points as well. We do currently lack robust population estimates for hedgehogs. Uh, the roadkill numbers are probably underestimated because there's scavengers eating the carcasses, which is a bit grisly to think about. Uh, and importantly, the effectiveness of these measures are rarely tested. And actually, if they are, they're not for long periods of time. And that is really what's needed. Uh, so a few conclusions to draw from all of this. Uh, we do have options for mitigation, but we need more long term monitoring um, to establish just how effective they are. And what that'll do is allow us to spot any changes in local populations and confidently link them back to the measure that was put in place. Um, additionally, wildlife should be considered at early planning stages, um, although bearing in mind that's easier said than done. Uh, so that's a bit of an overview of the research that's gone before and what we do know about hedgehogs on roads. Uh, so what I'll do now is hand over to Lauren, who's gonna tell you all about her ongoing research. So I'll stop my screen sharing. I'll just give a little bit of background information about Lauren just while she's um, while she's getting her screen share set up. So uh, Lauren is uh, completing a PhD project on hedgehogs and roads, which she started in 2019. Um, so she's now halfway through the project. Uh, she completed her undergraduate and master's degree in wildlife conservation and management. Uh, and after this, she worked in educational roles for the RSPB and as an ecological consultant. Uh, on the research side of things, she's worked in much hotter climates than the UK. So she's been part of projects tracking monkeys through the Brazilian rainforest um, and also monitoring bird communities in Madagascar. So, yeah, not jealous at all, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, are you all ready there, Lauren? I am. Yes. Thank you ever so much, Grace. Uh, no hello, problem. everyone. Um, so I'm going to do the same as Grace and I'm going to turn off my camera just to save the Wi-Fi because um, you never can tell what it might get up to. But um, so now we're going to discuss um, yeah, my, my PhD research and this is what I'm doing at the Nottingham Trent University and it's kindly part funded by the People's Trust for Endangered Species. So just to highlight where this research fits into the wider context of the issue, we know that up to 335 hedgehog, uh, thousand hedgehogs are killed on UK roads every single year. And of course, this is a welfare issue, but we also need to know if it is a conservation concern as well. The best way to do this is to look at the impacts of roads on local populations, because these populations can vary significantly and they tell us a very different picture about threats. 
The difficulty in understanding these impacts, however, is that getting enough data is really hard work, it's time consuming, and it's expensive. So we currently don't have enough data on roads and hedgehogs in the UK. And perhaps what we do have isn't fine scale enough to know uh, exactly what roads could mean for hedgehogs in the long term. This then leads to business as usual, with very little guidance available for targeted conservation efforts around roads, and the same up to 335,000 hedgehogs could be killed year after year. So some of you may be aware that the Department of Transport released a road warning signs with hedgehogs on in 2019, and they look like this one on the screen. So we're just gonna have a quick poll now, and we're interested to know if you've seen one of these official Department of Transport signs. So not ones that you might have bought yourself, not, not stickers, um, nothing that you might have bought from um, the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, but one of that you've gone through the council to, to apply for. And it's really quite lovely to see these uh, signs available. Previously, I've only really seen ones with deer and ducks on. So this is a terrific change. We've got a lovely, lovely number of you guys responding to this. Thank you very much. Great, so we can see that uh, a whopping 94% have not seen one of these official Department of Transport signs in your area. And perhaps that's really interesting, but not altogether surprising. And this is because these approved signs uh, require a huge amount of data to be submitted by the local councils to show that these signs are warranted. And uh, getting the, so much data is really hard work. And of all of the applications that were um, submitted so far, several have actually been rejected. So clearly getting more, more data and more evidence needed for this mitigation is key. And that's exactly where uh, this project fits in. So we want to understand how different hedgehog populations are faring around roads. And not just any road, we want to compare the impact of different road types so from the really busy A roads right down to the quiet and residential streets on our doorsteps, and also of different road densities and across a mix of suburban and rural hedgehog populations. So my team and I spent last summer losing a lot of sleep and going out every night and searching for hedgehogs in public spaces in order to count every hedgehog that we could find. We would give every he hedgehog a health check which is what I'm starting to do there in that middle picture. And we would determine if it is old or young individual, a young hedgehog being any individual that weighs 500 grams or less, and if it is male or it's female. From this, we can then build a picture of how big or small each population is, and specifically how many hoglets are being born each year. And information such as this are really useful signs uh, to tell us whether these populations are, are stable or not. So we've done these surveys uh, in four populations in Nottinghamshire, and each site is marked in grey on the map on the right hand side. So from these surveys, uh, the density of adults we found in each population is in the large hedgehog uh, on the left, and the density of hoglets is in the small hedgehog to the right. So we can see that, for example, the top left uh, population is really large and it's really, really healthy. And in fact, it's nearly twice as large as the usual population density for an urban or suburban area. And then we do have a range of population densities there from down to 41 adults per kilometer square, 13 and right down to seven. Those two small populations uh, are a fairly standard size for, for more rural areas where there's less supplementary food perhaps compared to more urban areas. But this variety of population sizes is a fantastic starting point to enable us to compare populations and really, really dig deep and pick apart the differences in the road effects at this local scale. This is one of my favourite parts of the project now, all about hedgehog movements. So now we know about the size and the structure of these local populations, 
We also want to know a bit about their movements and their interactions with roads. And this is because roads are known to change the behaviour of roadside animals, for example, where and how they move on a daily and even a seasonal basis. So to dig a bit deeper into this and understand the risks that hedgehogs are facing around roads, we are trying to understand which roads hedgehogs cross or perhaps don't cross, how often different individuals are crossing compared to one another, and also when at night or throughout the year they cross most often and therefore most at risk of being hit. So to do this, we use GPS technology to record a hedgehog's location every 10 minutes. And every 10 minutes is fine scale enough to ensure that we capture the majority of these road crossing events. To then find these GPS tags and download the data, I walk around and I look very, very silly holding this metal antenna above my head as in the middle photo. I cannot tell you how many strange looks I've had uh, and very strange comments over my time in this project when people say, see me doing this uh, around the local area. But ultimately, it's really great fun and it gives us an absolutely unparalleled insight into hedgehog movements. So this map on the right hand side is one of our, our four study areas in Nottinghamshire and it's one of the two uh, more rural areas also. Each coloured dot on that map is a location of a hedgehog that we've gathered over a three week period and each of the four colours is a different hedgehog. So in this village, there are luscious gardens and big school fields, uh, and the black line running along the top is a really busy A road. So from the points on the map, we can see that these hedgehogs are almost exclusively staying to the bottom of the village around this agricultural land, and very rarely crossing that busy A road at the top. Now, hedgehogs aren't territorial, and they certainly have the capabilities to walk that distance from the south of the village to that A road but they, they rarely venture very close. And this is even though that there are wonderful gardens and green spaces in this village, which we know that hedgehogs usually spend a lot of time in and uh, we thought to prefer. But of course, as a caveat, this observed behavior could be due to several different factors uh, that aren't immediately obvious. But we can now compare those movements uh, from the previous map to one of our more urban sites in Nottinghamshire, and this is one without an A road, uh, but lots of minor roads. So this is an animation showing a hedgehog movements of five different individuals at night. And we can really see that they're moving all over the village and crossing these minor roads really, uh, really quite often. The hedgehogs have been known to walk an average of one to two kilometers a night. So realistically, they're bound to be coming across lots of these roads in more built up and in residential areas. If you keep your eyes on uh, the males in the pink and yellow in particular, you can see that they're roaming really quite far. Uh, and we found that males actually cross roads nearly twice as often as the females. So as Grace mentioned earlier, this is likely to be a result of males simply having larger home ranges and wandering further than females. And we also found that the majority of those crossings um, happened between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. So perhaps later at night is slightly more risky for hedgehogs crossing roads than early mornings. So the final part of this project is really the crux of the issue. Uh, it's of course the, the hedgehog road mortality. So I drive around these villages and the surrounding area three or four times a week to record any hedgehog roadkill I see. Each purple dot on this map is uh, a poor hedgehog that I found since mid-May last year, and that's a whopping 42 hedgehogs on that map. Of course, uh, this only shows the fatal accidents, as there are likely to be some hedgehogs that are fatally injured by a car, and perhaps wander off into the bushes and are unseen during the surveys. So we can see that the majority of this roadkill uh, has occurred between, uh, near villages and towns and on minor roads as well. And this does mirror the, the studies that Grace mentioned earlier uh, for hedgehogs in Bulgaria and Turkey, as well as the citizen science data analysed nationwide in the UK. So we can compare this roadkill data to the population surveys I've mentioned earlier. And we can see what proportion of each population is killed each year, 
which we know is a crucial biological information. So we can see that somewhere between uh, 12 and over 30 percent of each pop uh, of a local population is killed every year. Uh, these high estimates are absolutely shocking uh, at the local scale, and intuitively, it is these smaller populations that raise most concern. So these smaller populations uh, need a good supply of hoglets or um, immigrating hedgehogs from other areas in order to stay stable over time. But we can also see that this proportional loss varies quite a lot. So not every population is affected the same, and how each population copes with this loss is ultimately down to factors such as their yearly growth and also other causes of mortality, such as natural predation. And whilst we do investigate this topic, it is important to consider that road impacts are only one piece of the puzzle, um, one of the many threats facing hedgehogs at this time. So it could be perhaps the final blow to some populations, but we do need to be mindful of the wider picture when it comes to hedgehog conservation. So what next for the project? Well, now we know that our roads are on our radar as a likely issue for hedgehogs, we need to know what can be done about it. So this summer, we'll be investigating whether road tunnels are an effective tool to allow hedgehogs to roam safely throughout the landscape. The construction of tunnels and also overpasses uh, over roads can be very expensive, costing tens to even hundreds of thousands of pounds. So we need to evaluate their effectiveness to make sure that they are justified, but also to make sure that we know how to make them as cost effective as possible. So we'll be studying the numbers and the movements of hedgehogs at several sites around the UK, one of which is shown in this uh, upcoming video. So this is a really large tunnel, it's uh, a few metres tall at one end, and a picture of which is to the left hand side of the slide. It then goes to a smaller tunnel, uh, an amphibian tunnel uh, facing right, a uh, picture of which is to the left of the video. There are uh, the fences running parallel to the road in between all of those tunnels to really guide those hedgehogs and other animals into the tunnel. So across all of our sites, we will have a huge variety in tunnel sizes, tunnel shapes and surrounding habitats. So by using GPS technology and camera traps, we'll be able to determine if hedgehogs are using these tunnels, if they prefer one tunnel type to another, and perhaps what other factors might be motivating them to use these tunnels more frequently. And finally, there's some really scary figs around saying that hedgehogs will soon be extinct in the UK. And this article here says that by 2025, they will be gone. We hope that with all of the new data that we've been gathering and will continue to gather for this upcoming year, we can generate some more accurate figures on, on how hedgehogs might be faring in the future, if current road mortality rates can be sustained, and even what difference these road tunnels could possibly make to populations in the long term. As hedgehogs can be difficult to study, uh, we will be investigating some potentially efficient ways to monitor hedgehog population trends um, in the long term. For example, using genetic methods at a smaller scale or even at a nationwide scale, where the roadkill can be used as a proxy for population sizes. And this would really help us conserve the populations when and where it is most critical. So I'd, I'd just like to finish by saying the biggest thank you to everyone involved in this project. It really is a collaborative effort involving the wonderful People's Trust for Endangered Species and the incredible local communities that I'm working with in Nottinghamshire. Thank you very, very much for listening. Right, thank you very much, Grace and Lauren, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, bear with me one second. Somebody turned off. Right. Um, if people want to turn on their videos, they are very welcome to now. Um, for some reason, I can't see my own video. It's quite. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so feel free to turn on your videos. Bear in mind that you might be recorded and you might end up 
uh, in the video, but that's fine. Uh, if anybody's got any questions that they'd like to ask Grace or Lauren, then if you raise your hand, then we'll come to you. Um, if you are asking a question, if you could please start by letting us know who you'd like to answer the question, um, whether it's Grace or Lauren. Um, right, okay, so I'm gonna start with a question for Grace because we've had a lot of questions in the chat with people telling us whereabouts in the country are, they are and asking if there are opportunities in Manchester, Nottingham, et cetera. So what I'd like to know is, is there a single place you can go to find out about hedgehog volunteering opportunities? Uh, so as far as I'm aware, there's not there's not a lot planned this year, just with the, all of the restrictions. I know that a lot of things have had to be cancelled. I had I have signed up for a few surveys myself last summer that did get cancelled. So as far as I'm aware, there's not um, anything in particular, but it's certainly worth contacting local wildlife trusts. Um, you know, there's there's sometimes different things going on in different areas, uh, but a really good thing to keep doing is to keep logging any sightings on the big hedgehog map. Um, Cause that's, you know, that's really important biological data. It tells us about the distribution of hedgehogs in the UK. Um, and that's also shared with biological record centers and the MBN Atlas, as I was saying before. And um, so that's, that's a really, a really good way to to contribute you know from the safety of your own sort of home or garden and um, so I would say to do that for now and then yeah as we hear about any projects we'll try and sort of advertise them on the website but there's yeah I think things are a little bit limited this year unfortunately just with the uncertainty of everything. But what I'm going to ask Grace to do is just drop a link in the chat for where you can sign up to a Hedgehog Street newsletter because I know that Grace tells people about what's going on through that and is that somewhere where you might announce where things are happening then, Grace? Yeah, so if you register on the Hedgehog Street website and become a Hedgehog Champion, you can get monthly um, emails. I'm actually sending one later today. Um, but yeah, so what I try and do on there is is kind of put any local projects that we hear about, um, local just community efforts and things. We try and highlight things like that. Because um, obviously Hedgehog Street's a national campaign, but we want to try and sort of link people up, you know, locally as well. So I'll just pull up a link. Brilliant. A registration link now, and I'll pop that in the chat. Right, while you're doing that, Grace, right, we've got loads of questions. So what I'm going to ask yourself, Lauren, and the people asking is if if we can try and be quick, then we can get, try and get through a few, because I'm aware we are fast running out of time. So I'm going to start with the people with their hands up, and I'm going to come, the order that I've got you in my screen, so Clive, because you've got your video turned on, you come first. Um, if you unmute, let us know who your question's for and what it is. Okay, so I'm Clive, I'm, I'm from Bristol, and I think my question is probably for Lauren. And it's about um, hedgehog highways, and I, I'm just wondering whether there's any um, evidence that they have a beneficial impact on the local population of hedgehogs. Absolutely. Uh, hedgehog highways are one of the, the most crucial things we can do to help hedgehogs um, at a local scale. And, you add it up and it helps a, na a nationwide scale as well. Uh, and this is for several reasons. Um, one is that you're simply giving access for these hedgehogs to roam around and um, to find all of these different uh, resources they might have, find different mates. But from a road perspective, if you, it's effectively boosting up their core area, their core habitat, which means that they're not going to have to roam uh, wide and cross these roads in order to find all the resources. Um, so I'm not aware of any specific research. There's have correlated those um, but theoretically it's absolutely bound to help uh, and we should definitely sort of keep up the good work and I know the People's Trust for Endangered Species and BHPS are doing wonderful things on that as well. Just to add in quickly as well the um, Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust did some research I'm just having a quick look to, to sort of jog my memory so there was a 39% increase in hedgehog sightings after people had made hedgehog highways um, and yeah, they generally had quite encouraging results that, yeah, there was there was more more sightings, more kind of, yeah, just enabling that movement within within the landscape. So, yeah, hedgehog highways are definitely a, yeah, please, please do. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Susan, you're next. OK, my name's Susan Tolman. I live in a village just outside Newbury in Berkshire. And my question's probably, I would guess, for Grace. Um, I'm new to hedgehogs. Um, I've become enthusiastic about them and I've got a hedgehog house, which I've just installed in my garden. So my question is not really about roads, but I don't know whether you can help. Um, if I get a hedgehog that, come to that comes to visit my house and I'm replenishing the 
um, the food and the water every day, is it likely that they will go away after a little while because they seem to come and go for a, a couple of days at a time and then come back? Um, so is there something I'm doing wrong? Maybe it's disturbing them when I replenish the food. That was the first question. The second one is I'd like to see them. So what sort of camera would you recommend for um, actually installing in the house itself? Uh, well, yeah, thank you. It's really nice to hear that you've got a hedgehog house in the garden and putting food and water out is a really good way to encourage them to the garden and, and to hopefully get a sighting. Um, we wouldn't recommend putting food and water inside the hedgehog house itself. We'd sort of keep the nesting site and the food, the feeding station kind of slightly apart from each other, um, just because we don't want to be attracting things like cats and foxes to the house itself. Um, so, so don't it's worth... put the food in the house, it's in the tunnel to the house. Put exactly. It yeah, and also, like you say, if there is a hedgehog in there, it's sort of getting, you know, it's getting a little bit disturbed each time there's, there's sort of food being replenished. Um, but you could put together a feeding station, just something like an upturned um, plastic storage box and put a little gap in there. And that'll mean that hedgehogs can access the food, but foxes and, um, and cats and things can't. So that's, um, yeah, that's a good way to, to just sort of keep things separate. And it's worth bearing in mind that they can travel, you know, two kilometres plus in a single night. So actually, it might be that they're, you know, if, people down the street are also leaving some food out and actually you know they're, they're making use of that supplementary food from hedgehogs and also natural food you know there might just be a good amount of natural insect prey so I don't think it's that you're doing anything wrong I think it's just that they, you know they do they do use different sites so I think just keep doing what you're doing but just keep the yeah keep the nesting site and the food a little bit separate. If I want to actually see one because I don't want to disturb it I w I'd like to put a camera actually in the hedgehog house itself, but I, I've no idea which sort of thing I should go for. Yeah, sorry, you did ask that. I'm just pulling up a link because we worked with an organisation called Nature Spy last year and they um, provided some with, they provided us, sorry, with some advice um, on the different options for cameras and they're, they're a really good organisation. They can sort of answer questions, point you in the right direction better than I can. So I'm just going to put... Well, Grace, that link in the chat. I will just, I'll mention as well though, Susan, if you want to get a good idea of all the wildlife that's used in your garden, um, a camera a camera trap, so a, a, a trail cam, can be quite a good thing to install in the garden so that you can see what else is coming in as well. Um, right. Obviously anything in the hedgehog house is only going to capture whatever is in there. So you yes. might have some nice images of things that you didn't realise were visit in your garden if, if you put something outside and then at least then you know there's no risk of disturbing anything. Yes okay and that will uh, this website will actually make it clear which camera is suitable for which things so I don't want to spend a lot of money and find out it's it's not the right sort of camera because I don't know what they're called. I believe so yeah it's got a few options on that page and a few bits yeah. of advice but you could always email Nature Spy and they, they can sort okay. of give you a bit of help but All yeah right. welcome to the the world of hedgehogs yeah if you head over Thank to you. hedgehogstreet.org we've yeah we've tried to put all the sort of tips and advice for for helping the mini okay. garden Thank you. on there. I'll lower my hand if yeah. I can work out how to do it. <laughs> okay Joanna if you could unmute yeah, there we go. Hello, um, I can't put my camera on because you've disabled it as host, but anyway. Um, I would like to know, you said badgers eat, <coughs> eat uh, hedgehogs, but do urban foxes, are they a danger to hedgehog populations? Uh, they can be, yes. Um, so I've done some surveying in um, Regent's Park in London and there's um, obviously there's there's a hedgehog population there, but there's obviously with it being a very urban area, there can be a lot of uh, foxes and they they don't seem to eat them, but they seem to sort of wait and attack them and they can sometimes cause sort of injuries to the back legs. Um, so it's a tricky one. Sometimes they'll attack them, but then equally we've got photos and video footage where they're both eating from the same food bowl. Um, so I think they, they can, depending on, it's probably the same as badgers. It sort of depends on the amount of resources that are available. Um, but yeah, they, they can be a bit of an issue, but badgers are the main the main predator in the UK. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting because we had a uh, an injured one with an injured back leg in the garden a few years back. So perhaps that was a... That, yeah, that's the typical injury that you get with often with foxes. So yeah, yeah. it could certainly be the case. Uh, Joanna, there was a really interesting talk from London Natural History Society uh, last week on urban foxes. It's available on YouTube. And part of what we looked at was the interaction between foxes, badgers, hedgehogs, and cats 
at feeding stations and who would win win out uh, between those animals. So it's quite an interesting read. Um, okay. Badgers do come out toughest, I believe, but cats were cats were tougher than foxes. So yeah, not an interesting read. It's an interesting watch, so I recommend that. Um, Trisha, we've got a lot of hands up. We don't normally get this many hands up, uh, Grace. <laughs> Hi, um, I wanted to ask, I, I saw it's actually in the chat. Are hedgehogs a protected species? And if not, why not? <laughs> I think I saw that in the chat. They're not a European protected species, but they, they're, they're a Schedule 6 species in the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So part of what we've had a campaign running recently to try and um, make them a Schedule 5 species. So at the moment, the hedgehog, them, the hedgehog itself is protected, but the habitat and the nesting sites aren't. So what we're trying to push for is that those nesting sites are protected as well. Um, so we've done that through um, an amendment to the Environment Bill to try and up that legal protection. Um, and also the BHPS have run a petition, which has just passed 100,000 signatures, which is fantastic. Um, again, calling for that same, uh, that same protection. So if anybody wants to sort of get involved, you can write to your MP um, to ask them to support this amendment. And you can still sign the petition as well. I don't know if people... Oh, I've just seen the... Yeah, that's the link. Someone's done my job for me. Um, yeah, so... There's ways to help, so they are, they do have some level of protection, but we'd yeah we'd like it to be more. Okay, Tina. Hey, unmute me. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Good, awesome. Um, my question would be to Grace and Lauren. Um, where habitats are fragmented, and we're worried about genetic uh, stagnancy, would it be an idea if we took individuals from areas into other areas just to increase the diversity of the genetic pool that makes them up? Has anyone done any research on that just to make them, you know, more resilient and Im improve the fact that inbreeding can cause a lot of problems for a hedgehog species? I think there's certainly welfare issues around kind of that sort of translocation idea. I don't know if, uh, do you know of any sort of research on that, Lauren? Um, I, I would um, recommend against it first. I think most of um, the scientific, scientific literature would point that way as well. Um, it ultimately seems like a good idea, but there can be lots of un, unseen, unrecognised uh, repercussions with that. Um, Perhaps it could be due to something with illnesses or diseases. Uh, it could be due to sort of behaviour. Also, uh, translocating and moving animals, and particularly hedgehogs as well, uh, can be a very stressful um, experience for yeah. them. So we wouldn't quite know at this stage how they might react. Um, and just popping them back in the same population uh, is absolutely the best thing to do. Uh, it would be the habitat that they're familiar with, um, and you know they'll, they'll know where all the resources are. Um, so I, I would say against that for now, but it's something we can certainly look into in the future. Cool. Thank you. All right. Alison? Is that me or another Alison? No, that's you, Alison T. <laughs> right. Well, back at the plot, um, I've got a sort of double question uh, to either Grace or Lauren or both, actually, um, in relation to the behaviour of councils, really. Um, in vis a -vis the hedgehog warning signs, leaving aside the fact that, yeah, the DFT seem to refuse virtually every application. It's my understanding, although it could be wrong, that there haven't been that many applications submitted. And do you know why this might be? And are you working on it? And the second thing is about tunnels. There's lots of questions in my head about hedgehogs and tunnels, but assuming one could get councils or the DFT or whoever would be responsible to put tunnels in, how does one then get them to maintain those tunnels so they don't get full of debris and silt and actually remain useful? Do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, so I can answer the, the question about the, the tunnels. Um, so it is um, really quite hard work to get these tunnels um, put in. Um, one, that they're expensive. Uh, and due to that, they do need a lot of evidence to justify that they're needed. Um, as for hedgehogs, as of yet, and actually many animals um, around the world, they, we don't quite have that justification um, showing that they are effective um, or they are wanting this, um, this large amount of money. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the upkeep of them, yes, they can certainly have debris. They can um, perhaps 
be prone to flooding if they're not quite in the right place. Um, so it's something that's responsible for, for perhaps um, ecological monitoring or the council that um, put them in there, perhaps that'll be their responsibility. Um, but they should uh, undergo they do that though. Realistically, do you think that they would actually do that ongoing work or would they just put them in and think that's job done and go and do something else? I know uh, what I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I think that it'd be in their best interest in order to make the, the tunnel um, as effective as possible. Um, if they've got all this debris that isn't allowing the animals to use them, then um, they're not being as effective and the money wouldn't, wouldn't be well spent for them. So I would hope that it's both in their best interest and in the animals' best interest to make sure that they're maintained as effectively as possible. I admire your optimism. Thank you. <laughs> Um, in terms of the signs, uh, in all honesty, I don't know how many have been applied for, how many have been granted, but I get a lot of messages from from people from Hedgehog Champions about this, just sort of saying, you know, I, I don't know what my local council wants. And it seems that the requirements seem to differ between local councils. I've heard of some councils who require that a petition's done. There needs to be a petition with 500 local signatures. So, I'm not, you know, that's a bit of a funny one. And also some are asking for evidence of, if there being human casualties as a result of hedgehogs using a particular road so all Sorry, seems what? to be different what we've again. actually done this yeah the there needs to be apparently because yeah so the the technically the signs offer for human safety not for hedgehogs um so that's that's quite an interesting one so it was yeah, i think when the sign was released they always kind of said this is it's it's for humans basically we've actually put some guidance together for local councils i'll just drop a link in the chat so we've tried to put some guidance together for local councils that basically highlights the research a lot of what we've talked about today just how you know how roads can be dangerous for hedgehogs um, and also signposting them to where they can access the the roadkill data so where they can sort of have a look at local roads so big hedgehog map all of that data um so that people can see yeah where there might be particular hot spots um so our next step is to sort of communicate this this guidance to local councils but if anybody is is sort of in the in the process of um oh wait sorry i think i've dropped that in the wrong place um uh yeah i've lost what i was saying but um yeah essentially yeah if you're um sort of in the process of asking the local council for one you can certainly send them this guidance um Mm. I've, I've yes, not asked that'll... mine for one yet, but I, I'm also running my own local map in addition to your map with a bit slightly different detail in, in the hope of getting enough information for all manner of things from the council. But it's a bit early days. I've only had it going for a couple of years. I push it relentlessly. And yours, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm aware no of time. I'm just going to take two more questions. I'm going to ask Ada what the burning question was from the chat. And then Nigel's been waiting quite patiently there, so we'll, we'll go to Nigel for that. Um, so yeah, Ada, we've got a burning question from the chat one that's maybe been asked a few times. Uh, maybe one that's, to, if there's one specific to Lauren as well in her research. Um, there was quite a lot of interest in the map that you put up about how they travel around the, the villages and things like that. Um, I think Martin asked a really good question that, uh, to discover whether hedgehogs tend to cross at particularly po particular points, or is it fairly random throughout the villages? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question, um, and one that should certainly be looked at more in terms of road ecology research um, all over the world. Um, and the answer, short answer, is yes. Um, there's there's clearly some places where um, they're crossing frequently. Um, it might be that these places are um, in between really good resources, perhaps it's near a green space, and perhaps their nesting site. Um, and they like to cross these perhaps because they're also seen as safer as well. Um, but one really interesting thing is that these frequent crossing places of, of animals isn't always the same place where um, they're frequently killed. So they're not always the same place as these roadkill hotspots. Um, so there's something to do with these places being a lot, lot, uh, a lot safer for them. And they're happier to cross back and forth. Um, perhaps it's less traffic. Uh, perhaps it's it's different sort of surrounding habitat quality as well. So it's a really interesting part, and it is something that I'll be looking further into with with more data I'm collecting this year. Okay, and then for our final question, I'm going to go to Nigel. So I know other people have got their hands up. I'm sorry, we're not going to have time because we're already 
over if we go to Nigel. So, Nigel, better make your question a good one. Um, well, thanks. I mean, I've got, I've got uh, one thing is to congratulate Lauren and Grace on the excellent work they're doing. Next thing is to really, really reinforce Lauren's message not to translocate hedgehogs around the countryside. She said exactly the right thing. Um, there is no evidence at all that uh, inbreeding is depressing hedgehog populations. Um, it's simply not uh, known whether this could possibly be the case, but the dangers of moving animals and moving diseases around, and also the welfare issues of just transplanting animals um, from one place to the next, um, they're all so negative, um, you know, basically do not do it. Um, but the question I have is, where was that bridge that you showed the video of? Was that in the UK? Um, I've never seen a bridge that good in the UK. Uh, yes. Or exactly. an underpass, I should say. <laughs> uh, it's actually in Peterborough. Um, so one side is a nature reserve. The other side is, uh, is houses, a residential area. Um, so I'm really excited to get out there and um, survey the hedgehogs there. We can also see how they're interacting with these tunnels, um, perhaps how many hedgehogs are using them. If they're going towards the tunnel and perhaps turning around and, and not going through, uh, is it male or females using these tunnels? All sorts of questions. Um, so Peterborough is the place to be. Great, thank you. So I, I hope Kieran that was a short enough question. <laughs> Thanks Nigel. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, so thank you very much, Nigel. On that note, I'm just going to stop the recording.